and it's creating problems. So we were here. So we were here. So here the doctor was held to have been criminally negligent and he was convicted for manslaughter and in this case the act was seen as manslaughter since it caused the death and thereby the doctor was held guilty of manslaughter. This was in R versus Akirkele and again this is a Nigerian case. Now in Somalia, torts are covered under the Somali Civil Code as we discussed earlier including the entire gamut of civil and contractual laws. Now. In India, depending on the degree of negligence, it may be considered maybe as a tort or a crime, this medical negligence, or both, just as in USA or UK. So much of India's laws are based and borrowed from the English common law system. Now, some case laws to understand this concept in A.S. Mittal versus State of UP, AIR 1989. SC is Supreme Court 1570. This is an Indian case. Here, the Supreme Court laid down that when a doctor is consulted by a patient, the doctor owes to his patient certain duties, which are one duty of care in deciding whether to undertake. Okay, in deciding whether the patient has to go through a particular, you know, treatment. Second is duty of care in deciding what treatment is to be given and see duty of care while administering the treatment. So the duty of the doctor is to decide what kind of treatment, whether the treatment is required and while administering the uh, treatment, duty of care. So a breach of any of the above duties may give rise to an action for negligence and the patient may on the, that basis recover damage from his doctor. Here the apex court, inter alia, apex court of India is the Supreme Court. Here the apex court, inter alia, observe that negligence may manifest in several ways. It may be active negligence, that means which can clearly seen, it's quite approximate, there is a proximate cause or a collateral negligence that means something is there is an adjoining reason to it, comparative negligence, co-negligence, continued negligence, criminal negligence, gross negligence, or active negligence and passive negligence, willful or reckless negligence. That is, if a person is actively involved or even without doing anything, it has caused a damage or it is on purpose or without purpose or just being rash, that is reckless 
So all these uh, things have to be considered by the court. Next is in Jagdish Ram versus State of Marshal Pradesh 2008. Here, now why these case laws are important is you will understand how the theory of medical negligence is built. How different courts have viewed the concept of medical negligence. How they have built upon this theory saying that the doctor has to decide whether at all a particular treatment has to be given, as we just seen in Mittal's case, whether at all the treatment is required. Second is, if required, how it should be administered. So all these things should be taken into consideration while deciding medical negligence case, because it's quite a sensitive you know, concept. Now, in Jagdish Ram and others, ORS means others, others was a state of Marshal Pradesh, 2008 ACJ. 433, the Apex Court observed here that professionals such as lawyers, doctors, architects, and others are included in the category of those individuals who are particularly skilled and trained in their respective fields and oh, in the Any task or job requiring specialist skills is included in the professional skill. Now, every person joining a career of any branch needs a certain degree of knowledge of that particular branch to be considered as professional and is required that he or she should exercise his or her work with due care. Now, he or she assures that the clients are treated with proper care and caution and will exercise his job to that extent. But of, of course, you cannot always offer and gar a guarantee of the outcome. For example, even if there's a lawyer, a lawyer may take up the case of the client the lawyer will say that I will do my best, you know, to defend you or to give you your rights, depending upon what is the case. I will do, they will say that, the lawyer will say that the, he, he or she will do his or her best, but we do not know what is the outcome. I mean, that's a general thing in every profession because now for a lawyer, it's dependent on the judge. It, it's dependent upon several factors. Same way, the doctors would say, I will do my best, but. As a general saying goes, life belongs to God and it is in the hands of God and the person has to heal because healer is God and the doctor is the one who's just as an instrument. So that's a general saying everywhere, I guess. So in every profession for that matter, due diligence, due care, professional prudence has to be exercised pro tanto, that is to the maximum extent, to the maximum knowledge possible. However, one should not be reckless or negligent and cannot have a careless attitude. That is That goes for any profession, and that was what was held in that particular case, be it a doctor, lawyer, architect, or whoever. Then the liability under medical negligence may be civil as well as criminal liability. Whether it's a doctor or even the hospital as a whole or any medical professional exhibiting negligence can be liable under tort as well as criminal laws. Now, medical negligence may also amount to medical malpractice, remember, Medical negligence can also amount to medical malpractice. That is, you know, doing wrong things under the garb of, you know, a medical facility. So it may amount to even medical malpractice when the act or the omission goes beyond the present of mere negligence. In M. Ramesh Reddy versus State of Andhra Pradesh, that is an Indian case again, the hospital authorities were held negligent inter alia for not maintaining the patient's bathroom on time, which resulted in the fall of an obstetric patient, that means a gynecology patient, a lady in the bathroom, leading to her, you know, death. And the compensation of just one lakh was awarded in the facts and circumstances of the case. And it was awarded against the hospital and the hospital was made liable to pay one lakh for not maintaining the hospital, which resulted in the lady, you know, slipping and falling in the bathroom. So in Suresh Gupta versus government of NCT Delhi, 2006 SCC 422, the Supreme Court here held that the legal position was quite clear and well settled that whenever a patient died due to medical negligence, the doctor is liable in civil law for paying the compensation. And only when the negligence was so gross and his act was as reckless as to endanger the life of the patient, criminal law for offense under section 304A of Indian Penal Code will apply. 
So this is what was held. So apart from medical negligence, in case it is so gross and it was so reckless to, as to endanger life, even the criminal laws would be activated against the person. Now, in Wilshire versus Essex, this is a classic and a landmark, landmark case law, an English tort case, which is decided by the HOL. HOL means the House of Lords. Now here, there was a premature baby and she was given too much of oxygen by a junior doctor. There was this premature baby and the baby was given too much of oxygen by a junior doctor. So the baby was therefore found to suffer from a condition of excessive oxygen as a result, which res uh, you know, resulted in damaging the child's retina, which retina that is the eye, okay, retina in the eye, retina, which left the child completely blind in one eye and partially sighted in the other. That means oxygen was so much that it, you know, made the child, uh, it disabled the child's ability to see. The child was disabled to the extent of the one eye's retina was fully damaged and the other eye was partially damaged. So it was later surmised that is concluded and summarized that excess oxygen could have been the cause of the impairment of the child's retina. However, other factors relating to the premature birth also could have been a cause. So the House of Lords concluded and held that the health authority is liable for the negligence because of excessive oxygen that was given in the facts and circumstances of that case. Now there is this Bolam test, the Bolam test or the Bolam test. In Bolam versus Fran, 1957, 1 WLR 583587. Now the facts of the case here is in this case, they came up with the Bolam test. So here, the petitioner was undergoing electroconvulsive therapy as treatment for his mental illness. Now here, the doctor did not give any relaxant drugs, which was expected to be given. As a result, the claimant suffered a serious fracture. Now there was a divided opinion among professionals in the field, in the medical field, that relax, relaxant drugs should, whether or not should be given is a matter of choice and you know, they, they, there was divided opinion. Now, if they are given, there is a very small risk of death. And if they are not given, there is small risk of fracture. So there was a divided opinion. Like sometimes they always have. So here the petitioner argued that the doctor was in breach of the duty by not using the relaxing drug, which caused a serious fracture to him. But the court held that the House of Lords there formulated the Bolam test and held that the doctor was not in breach of duty. Why? Why? Because in such a situation where the medical, where medical science itself is now in kind of different opinions, you see? So a medical professional is, or a practitioner is not guilty of negligence if he or she has acted in accordance with a normal practice or a practice that is generally accepted as proper by a reasonable body of medical men skilled in that particular art. And putting it the other way around, a man is not negligent if he is acting in accordance with such a practice merely because there is a body of opinion who would take a contrary view. So the Balak test basically, you know, it became a key case authority for this principle, that although the law imposes a duty of care between the doctor and his patient, now the standard of care also should be taken into consideration as a matter in, for medical judgments or in matter of medical um, you know, negligence. So the court also has to consider the Bolam test. Bolam test means take into consideration also the standard of care that is expected, whether at all, the doctor exercised that level of standard, that standard of care was, you know, exercised and administered or not. So that is the Bolam test. Now, on the standard of care, there is also another, uh, you know, case law, but it is not really related to medical negligence, but just to help you understand what is the standard of care. This is Bolton versus Stone. In Bolton versus Stone here, the plaintiff now, just try to even imagine this case in your mind. There was this plaintiff who lived on the side street and near his house on the other side, there was a cricket club which had a huge ground. So near the plaintiff's house, there was this huge cricket ground and there was this cricket club. 
Now, one day it just happened that, I mean, there are series of matches going on on the cricket ground. And normally, you know, when you play cricket, the ball would normally cross the compound of the cricket club. But it's not always, uh, you know, a usual phenomena there. It depends. And uh, there has been, uh, you know, witnesses saying in this case that hardly we have seen any balls or longest balls that during the last 40 years that we have been staying in this area or moving around this area, it is, it is not to the extent that it will always move beyond the compound or move beyond the fence. So in this case, what happened was this guy, the plaintiff was there living uh, in a side street and there was a game which was going on and there was one of the longest hits in such a way, like, you know, you call it a sixer that goes beyond the compound wall and it went way beyond the compound wall to the extent that it, you know, it hit the plaintiff while he was there at the side street. So because of that, he sued the cricket club for negligence, saying that it is because of the game that happened there in the cricket club. And he sued them for negligence under the law of tort. So now the court held that there was no breach of duty while they applied the standard of care in this particular case. They said that in this case, standard of care has to be applied, standard of care principle, and that the probability of the risk of injury that could be ascertained. So that has to be taken into consideration. What is the probability? This is important. The probability or the possibility of the risk of injury that needs to be checked out, that needs to be ascertained, that needs to be examined, ascertained, studied, found out. The probability of the risk of injury. So therefore, to understand the probability of the risk of injury, standard of care principle is allowed. Whether the expected normal prudent standard of care is applied and what is the relationship with the injury and the probability of the risk of injury that needs to be ascertained here so here in this case the chances to be hit by a ball on the side street was remote i mean it's quite rare it's it was remote and that a reasonable person would actually not foresee are you understanding? So this is what held, was held in this case. And this is an example for you for standard of care. There is yet another case, Dr. Conrad Murray's case, and it is a famous case. He was, Dr. Conrad Murray was, Murray was Michael Jackson's, uh, I'm sure you know who's Michael Jackson, Jackson. So he was this Michael Jackson's personal physician. Mr. Murray was Michael, Dr. Murray was Michael Jackson's personal physician. And he was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter attributing to criminal negligence, you know, as a cause. They said that, you know, there was medical negligence, which could, which could be, you know, it, it comes within the ambit of criminal negligence. And that is the cause of, you know, the death of Michael Jackson. And therefore, he, they said that he would be held, the doctor would be held for manslaughter. So it was established during the trial that Dr. Murray administered a lethal dose of anesthesia or, or anesthetic profanol. A lethal dose, that means that could lead to death of a person. The extent, the, the amount was a little higher. A lethal dose of anesthetic profanol on Michael Jackson in his house and that left him, and then left him without medical supervision. So the court described Dr. Murray's conduct as reckless and he was sentenced to two years imprisonment. This case is a famous case you can mention because this is also a case of medical negligence, Dr. Conrad Murray's case. Now, there are several unreported cases that, means that really do not come in the journals, but of course, you will find it as, you know, TV reports, magazine, and so on. Just two more two, three slides, we complete that. Please bear with me. So, the Duke University Hospital, this was a very famous hospital, and it is a famous hospital in North Carolina, USA. It is also called as the Duke University Hospital. Why we do not have a citation is because it's not a reported case. That means it's not available in legal journals. I mean, you, you have the citations there, it's not available. It's just generally available as a news, probably in some journals or magazines or, you know, or even on the internet as a story or, uh, you know, as press reports. So in this case, in 2003, there was a news aired of a story that led to the death of a 17-year-old girl, Jessica, who was subjected to lung and heart transplant surgery. 
by the hospital without verifying the blood group of the donor. Now, this is a kind of the worst form of medical negligence because everybody knows that whenever there is organ transplant, normally, and for any purpose for that matter, the blood group of the person, of the patient is always tested. And in this case, they, Jessica okay, well, the Jessica transplant surgery. However, the, the hospital did not verify the blood group of the, of the donor. So however, after Jessica's body, you know, there was this transplant and later on, Jessica's body began shutting down and the hospital realized only then that the blood group of the donor didn't match. When the body is shutting down in the sense she was almost dying, it was at that time that the, the, the hospital realized that the group, the blood group of the donor didn't matter this you know, whoever is donating the organ. So now the hospital therefore tried to hush up the matter, that is to close the matter for 11 days. But later they admitted that, you know, they were at fault. And then they implemented a system of mandatory blood group checks before any transplant or any procedure. And of course, they were taken to task later on. Then there is this University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle's case, again, a US case. In the year 2000, there was one Mr. Donald Church who underwent a surgery to have an, ab an abdominal tumor, tumor in the stomach removed at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. Now, during the course of the surgery, the surgeons sealed the patient's abdomen oblivious of a 13 inch metal, metal retractor left inside the belly. That means they forgot a 13 inch metal retractor inside his stomach, inside his belly, while they were performing surgery, they forgot an instrument, a surgical instrument inside his stomach. So it was only after two months, the surgical mistake came to light when Mr. You know, Church started complaining of stomach ache and so on. And only after two months of the surgery, they realized, oh, there is a surgical instrument in his stomach. So then Mr. Church later on, of course, like he was operated again, it was removed and long story short, Mr. Church recovered after a subsequent injury, but this time for removal of surgical instrument. And of course, he filed a case and he awarded, he was awarded 97,000 in damages. Filed a case in the sense he complained, he raised a complaint and then he was awarded $97,000 in US dollars for in damages. Then there is this last case. You can find number of unreported cases, but I just chosen a few. In Dari Eason's case of losing both her breasts, and again, uh, this is where she was wrongfully diagnosed with breast cancer because there was mix up of, uh, you know, medical reports. And finally, in fact, the medical report did not belong to her; it belonged to some other patient, and the lab reports got mixed up, and as a result, you know. They thought it was she and the doctor literally advised her and forced her mastectomy. And later on, they realized, well, it was not her lab report. And then the 35 year old woman, she filed a suit for medical negligence. And then she managed to settle that is compromised in the matter, settle, close the case for USD 2.5 million as damages after losing you know, her body almost. So these are some of the cases of medical negligence. Now, thereby, in deciding and or adjudicating cases of medical negligence, a pragmatic approach, a practical approach is required so as to draw relevant and justifiable conclusions. So with that, we finish the topic on negligence. So any questions here? Any questions? So all no of you are present. Kasim uh, is not there. Uh, one, two, yeah, what all of the, you Kasim, he is he here. He don't understand. There is a, a technical problem. You, you, we will help him to join again. Next class. Okay, so just advise him on that. I'll grant him attendance because this was his first class. And as you say that he did not uh, understand because for, uh, you know, attendance to be granted, the, the student has to be available throughout the session. So. That means with Qasim, you are seven in all, so all of you would be granted attendance. Bye-bye and see you for the next class, the class on jurisprudence. Bye-bye. Okay, goodbye. We'll see you next class. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.